The story happened about 15 years ago. I was in Austin, Texas on a golf course playing, having a great time, but I get to about hole six or hole seven and I feel some really significant pain uh, in my stomach, so much that I have to stop playing. I head up to the clubhouse to just try to uh, deal with this issue in the restroom a little bit and um, that did not work. The pain continued to increase in my stomach and so I had to drive myself home. I got back to my apartment there in Austin, Texas and wound up just laying down on the floor of my bathroom, just kind of hugging the toilet, praying for this pain to go away. It's the most significant pain I've ever felt in my entire life. Uh, at the time, Jamie, my wife, she was uh, away, just out camping with her girlfriends, but I called her and said like, babe, you've gotta get home, you've gotta take me to the ER, I don't know what's going on. And so she does, I'm just sitting there curled up in a ball while she finally comes to the apartment. She gets me, she takes me to the ER. They start scanning me, trying to figure out what goes on, they finally come out and they go, Mr. Garner, you're the proud father of three kidney stones. And so this is my first experience with kidney stones. I'm like, oh my goodness, well that explains everything. But now what are we gonna do to get these things out of my body and to get relief from pain? And they said, well, typically the procedure, what we do is we have this little kind of cage grabber and we just kind of go up there, grab them and pull them out. And I was like, go up there and grab them? I was like, doc, is there any other option? And she said, oh yeah, yeah, there's this procedure called lithotripsy where it just kind of blast sound waves at you, it breaks them up and then you just pass them and you don't even feel a thing and I'm like, why did you start with that option? Like, that's the one I want. So we had to do this lithotripsy, but she said, here's the thing. If you do this and you, you pass them naturally, you have to catch them because we need to have them and we need to analyze them to figure out what is going on, what is wrong in your body. And so they gave me this really discreet funnel. And so I had to take this thing with me everywhere. And so I remember Jamie and I going to this uh, really fancy restaurant in Austin in the domain, and I've got my strainer with me. And so I'm like, here you go, babe, put this in your purse. And so she takes it in, halfway through the meal, I'm like, oh, it's time, can I have my strainer? And you can't be discreet with this thing. You ought to just let everybody know, hey, I'm about to go try to catch some kidney stones. And so I, I walk to the bathroom, and I got them, baby. Today was the day, so I come out, and I have to embarrassingly ask, uh, the waiter for a to-go bag for my little stones that I've passed, take my strainer, hand it back to Jane and say, could you put this in your purse? I think she burnt the purse after that, absolutely terrible. So I, I get the stones back, I get them to the doctor, and they start analyzing them, they figure out they're like, hey, these are uh, calcium stones. Now there's different reasons that can cause these calcium stones, one of which was like chocolate, and I'm like, doc, is it the chocolate ones? And they're like, no, it's not the chocolate ones. I'm like, whoo, praise God, because I love me some chocolate. So come to find out what was happening was after a series of tests, uh, I, I had hyperparathyroidism. So I don't know if you know this, but you should have two parathyroids. They should reside in your uh, neck, but I didn't. I had one in my neck and one in my chest. It didn't wake up, it didn't go where it's supposed to go, it wasn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. And so what was happening is that parathyroid was actually pulling calcium out of my bones, putting it into my bloodstream, thus causing kidney stones. Not only that, it was causing osteoporosis. The doctor talked to me and said, Destin, you have the bones of an 80-year-old woman. Now, if you're an 80-year-old woman watching this, I'm not taking a shot at you. That's just literally what the doctor told me. And so we had to go through, we had to, they said, we gotta, we gotta get that parathyroid out. I'm like, is it like a go up there and get it surgery? They're like, no, we're just gonna cut your neck open and get it. I'm like, great, let's do that one. I'd much rather have that. So I get into the surgery, take the parathyroid out, and then slowly my body begins to recover. So here's why I'm telling you this. What I realized was I thought I was a healthy individual. I had health, but there was something off inside of me something wrong, something not operating right and properly and unbeknownst to me, it was causing a decrease in health. And then there was an issue, there was a situation there on the golf course that kind of triggered something, revealed I wasn't as healthy as I thought I was. Now that that's out, that situation's been corrected, I now have the bones of a 70-year-old woman. No, I'm just kidding. I think I've got good, strong bones now and never had a kidney stone since. Now, I'm not telling you a story to talk about kidney stones and cage grabbers and lithotripsy, but I hope you would see a very similar spiritual connection. Maybe in your own life, there was a time where you were spiritually healthy, spiritually vital, 
And maybe over time, maybe even unbeknownst to you, something's happened. Something got off kilter, out of whack, something's gone wrong, and there was an event. There was a moment, and something revealed that you're not as healthy, spiritually healthy, as you thought you were, as you once were. Maybe as you're watching this today, you would admit, yeah, I'm actually spiritually dry. I've spiritually atrophied. There was a time in a relationship I had with Jesus that's not there anymore. Something has woken me up to that, but how do I get back there? How do I experience spiritual vitality again? How do I get back to this abundant, deep, abiding relationship with Jesus that I once had, that something's happened over time and I've lost? That's what I want to talk about today. How can you experience personal revival? And to do so, I want to be just very practical, give you six steps through the lens, through the life of King Josiah, who led his nation in an incredible revival. And I think we can pull from that and learn from that and apply it to our lives. I love King Josiah. I love his story. So much so, I've actually named my son after this character in the Bible. And so we want to look at King Josiah and what's going on. Draw the principles out. Now, the first one we have to get to, even before we get to King Josiah, the first step in experiencing personal revival, we have to look at the context in which King Josiah comes to the throne. Check this out, 2 Kings 21. Manasseh, this is Josiah's granddad, was 12 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hezebiah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations who the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He erected the altars of Baal and made Asherah, as Ahab, the king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He built altars to the pagan gods in the house of the Lord, which the Lord has said, in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts and in the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering. He used fortune tellings and omens and dealt with mediums and necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He said, shed much innocent blood, which most people think he killed off most of the prophets of God. So it's kind of hard to understand, but let me kind of put this in modern day context. Let's say one day you decide to drive to a church or you tune in online like you're doing right now. And what we have is uh, there's, there's an ability to worship multiple gods, right? You can worship a god in this building or in that building or choose this sermon online to worship a different god. And if you were in the building, in the presence, you could go to these holy, set-apart, sacred people. You could have relations with them, and you would be more successful in your job and your business. When I start up the sermon, I would say, man, so glad you're here today. We've got a statue of Shiva, a statue of Buddha. Here, here's a Jewish star. We're going to kind of do all these things. This week, I went and had my palm read. I talked to some dead people, and I've got a great message for you. We open with worship to the sun, the moon, and the stars. And to finish it all off, we go outside and I bring my son and I sacrifice him on the altar to a God named Molech. That's kind of a modern day interpretation of what is happening in Manasseh's day. This went on for 55 years. After Manasseh dies, his son Ammon takes the throne. The only difference between Manasseh and Ammon is that Ammon was worse. Ammon only was in reign and kingship for two years. Why so short? Because his servants saw and thought he was so bad as a king, they killed him himself. It says, verse 23, the servants of Ammon conspired against him and put the king to death in his own house. Well, looks like we need a new king. So who's up next? Who's in line? From Manasseh to Ammon, now it's Josiah, the son of Ammon. He takes the throne when he's eight years old. The text says, Ammon was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah, and Josiah, his son, reigned 
in his place. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. One of the first things, a step to spiritual revival is, is realizing this. Josiah didn't pick this. He was just put in this position. He didn't choose for Manasseh to be his granddad. He didn't choose for Ammon to be his father. He didn't choose for all these things to happen. This was just laid on him. He just inherited this at nothing of his own doing. I think the principle here is that some of you may have experienced spiritual setback. You may be experiencing a spiritual dryness, a lack of spiritual vitality because of nothing you have done. Something's been done to you. You've just inherited a situation that's knocked the spiritual life out of you. Something your husband or wife said or did, something your children said or did, something a a boss at work said or did. Maybe a complete stranger said or did something to you and it's just knocked the spiritual life out of you. You did nothing, you just inherited that, just like King Josiah did. I think the first step we have to take in experiencing spiritual revival is that we have to refresh our perspective around the situation you find yourself in. And I don't wanna make light of any situation you find yourself in. It it may be so serious. I'm not making light of Josiah's situation, but I, I love what this boy king does. He doesn't whine, he doesn't cry, he doesn't play the victim card. He would have every right to. None of us would blame him for that. But instead, he does something totally different. There's a show that Jamie and I watch called The Crown. We're great at starting shows, we're terrible about finishing them, but got into this, and there's this one line from the, the actress who plays Queen Elizabeth that would just struck me so powerfully, right? Queen Elizabeth is really not supposed to be queen. Her dad had a brother who was supposed to be king. He kind of abdicated, and so like all of a sudden, her dad's now here in this position, and now she's got to be the queen. And so she says this. She says, I am aware that I'm surrounded by people who feel they could do the job better, stronger people, with powerful character, more natural leaders, and perhaps better suited to leading from the front and making a mark. But for better or worse, the crown has landed on my head. I think that situation is so true of many of us today. I don't know what's landed on your head. I don't know what's been put in your lap. I don't know what kind of hand you've been dealt. And maybe it has nothing to do with anything you've done, you've just inherited it. It just landed on your head like Josiah. But what will we do with the hand we've been dealt, even if it's a bad one? What will we do with what's landed on our head, even if we didn't want it? We have to refresh our perspective on the situation we're in, just like Josiah did. Question, do you need to refresh your perspective on your current life circumstances. Josiah lives a little longer. He's now at the age of 26 in the store. It's been 18 years. He, he looks over, he sees the, the temple of the Lord. Now he probably believed in, in Yahweh, kind of understood and tried. And, and now at this time, he, he sees that the temple of the Lord is in ruin. And he's like, hey, we need to fix that. We need to correct that. And here's what the text says in 2 Kings 22. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, your servants had emptied the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now, you realize what found the book of the law means, right? It means they lost the Bible. So when we study this and read this, most scholars would say, at minimum, this is the book of Deuteronomy. At most, it's the entire Pentateuch. When I say the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and when I say lost it, I don't mean like, oh, we read it yesterday and we can't find out where we placed it. I mean like, didn't even know it existed for like 55, another 26 years or so, and maybe like 70, 80 years, 
Josiah wasn't even aware of this existence. And now they bring it out and read it and find this book of the law. So think about this. If, if you had this happen to you, there's some options on how you respond. Josiah could have got this book of law and heard this and read it and gone like, oh my goodness, we're not living anywhere close. Put that thing back, like go bury it and hide it again, right? Or he could be like, you can't hold me accountable to that. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know that was the book of law. We didn't have it to read it. So he could make excuse day after day. But that's not what he did. Those would not have led to revival. Listen to what King Josiah did. 2 Kings 22, 11. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. See, the second step to experiencing revival is to show remorse and seriously repent when our shortcomings are revealed. Right, I think you say it this way. The moment revival begins is the moment we stop excusing and start confessing our sin. Josiah could have excused it. He could have ignored it. He could have tried to justify it, but he didn't. He just owned the fact that they were not in line with the will of God and the way of God. And he tore his clothes and he mourned and he confessed. Question for you to contemplate as you're thinking about wanting to, desiring to, experiencing personal revival. Is there anything do you enjoy? Do you tolerate? Do you excuse any sin? Or do you absolutely hate your sin? Are you sorry for your sin? And do you want to stop your sin? We live in a culture today that almost normalizes and sometimes celebrates sin. And we have to get to the fact, like Josiah, could have ignored it, could have justified it, but he confessed it, he felt remorse for it, he hated it, and he wanted to fall in line with the will and the way of God. We go on in the book of Kings, 2 Kings 23, see the next step. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him, and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great, and he read in their hearing, the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar, he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people joined in the covenant. I want you to think, I want you to imagine how hard this would be. They've been 70 years, not even knowing the book of the law exists. They found it in the house of the Lord. Now it comes and it cuts and contradicts with everything going on in their life. Imagine how hard it would be to stand up and say, hey, we gotta change all this. We gotta stop like right now cold turkey. I imagine it this way. So let's say in our modern day context, you became president. Congratulations, you did it, you won. You're, 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 you're the president. Okay, now someone comes to you, an advisor or something like that says, oh my goodness, new president. We just found a piece of the Constitution hidden in the Smithsonian. There's so much stuff in there we didn't even know, but we found it, it was the disrepair, and here it is. And they read to you the Constitution. We found. They go, oh, it says that, that all meals must be cooked in home that restaurants are illegal, that eating out is strictly forbidden. Here you go. I mean, what would you do with that? Could you imagine? I mean, how much money is in the restaurant business? How many people's livelihood are tied to that? Farmers and truckers and chefs and waiters. And how many people go out and use? That's what it would be like in that situation, in that society that Josiah's in. The temple, the religious practice was like the center of life. How many people's livelihood were connected to the Baals and the Asherahs and the, the temple cult prostitution, right? How many people were giving money to this? How much was happening? And then to come in and say, you're all done, you're all out of business, I'm shutting this place down, we've got another way? 
that would be incredibly hard, immense pressure, so much pushback, but he has to do it. This is why he gathers everyone together because it can't be done alone. It can't just be done by himself. He needs the whole community to get this and to hear this. So the third step to take to experience personal revival is to recommit within the context of community. For Josiah, he, he's leading a nation, so he has to do this with the nation. Now, there's no reason if there's something for you, you wanna experience revival again, there's something in your life and you need to kind of confess and recommit, you don't need to bring that to the nation, okay, and make that totally public. But are there people, trusted, godly, mature, Christian believers that you can tell it to and they can love you and hold you accountable for what you're recommitting to do, right? And we all know this to be true. We need others. Like, have any of you ever tried to start a diet and tell no one? Like, what's the success rate of that? Big fat zero is what it is, where if you're just in your head, like, yeah, I'm just gonna diet, then you're gonna show up to some party or be invited out by friends, and there's just gonna be so much temptation, you're like, all right, I'll start tomorrow, right? Those work when we, when we get other people on board and tell them, no, I can't have that. Stop baking that. Don't invite me to that, right? That's when it works. We need to recommit within the context of community. And the same is true to experience spiritual revival. So the question for you, what recommitments do you need to make and who needs to know? 2 Kings 23, 4, and the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, for all the host of heaven. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and carried their ashes to Bethel. He deposed the priest, means he killed all these false priests. He brought out the Asher from the house of the Lord. He broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes. He broke down the high places. He defiled Tothbeth, that no one might burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Molech. He removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. He burned the chariots of sun with fire. And it goes on and on and on. Here's what you need to know. Brother clean house. He saw the things that were leading people away from the Lord and he didn't just turn a blind eye or acknowledge them or slowly maybe we'll correct it. He just rips them out, burns them and destroys them and decimates them, which I think is a great principle for you and I to experience revival. We need to remove everything that would lead us away from the worship of God. Not just ignore it, not tolerate it, not turn a blind eye to it. We need to rip it out, kill it, destroy it, get it away. That's preventing us from experiencing that spiritual vitality that we've had. There's a story that kind of sums this up, reminds me of this a little bit. And uh, I don't know what, what your role at night is in the house. My role is the, the light shutter offer. That is my pleasure as a father to walk around the house and be like, this light, this light, this light. This. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm saving the world and electricity and money and all that good stuff. So I'm the light shutter offer. So I'm going around the house one night, shutting off all the lights. I get the last light. It's in the kitchen. I reach around to shut off the light. And there it is. There's a snake in my kitchen. Now, I don't know about you. you. You may be like, oh, no big deal. Just go pick it up and throw it outside. Not me. I am terrified of snakes. It all started when I was a little kid. I think my dad was watching Indiana Jones, and I walked through the living room, and I saw the part where Indiana fell in the pit of snakes. It's over for me. I hate snakes. I can't stand them. I don't want to look at them. I don't want to look at them online. Anywhere, right? I can't stand them. We go to the zoo with my little girls, and so they want to go into the, the herpetorium, which I call the hell house, and I'm like, good luck. You can go in by yourself because I'm not going in there, okay? So I hate them. But now there's a snake in my kitchen. At the time, my wife's sleeping in the bedroom. I got a newborn baby there in the house. So I have to do what any strong man, protective husband must do. And so what I do when I see that snake is I jump up on the counter. And I'll go, Jamie, try not to wake the baby, but I'm screaming, Jamie, Jamie's asleep. And I'm like, I'm, gonna, I'm not above getting my wife to wake up and kill this snake because I'm so terrified of him. Jamie's not waking up. So I got to get off the counter and actually go kill this thing. 
So I get off the counter and I, I walk to the garage to get some of my killing tools, you know, and I come back with a rake. That's all I could find. That's all I have, right? There's just this metal rake. And when I come back, I'm like, oh, please, Jesus, just let the snake still be there and not somewhere in my house. And I can go find him. And he was. He was ready for a fight. He was like climbing up. The, he was like taunting me. He was climbing up the wall. Be like, blah, blah, blah. like, come on, bring it. And so I didn't know what to do. I got this rake. I'm like, I'm gonna, you know, I can't scratch him like that. Or I'm going to mess up the tile. And I'm like, well, I've, I've seen a knight's tail, so I'm just going to joust him. So I flip the rake over. I've got the wooden handle on the ground. I just like brave heart scream, just go, ah! and I run and I, I hit the snake, pin him against the wall. Boom, he splits in half. And now I'm just jacked up. I'm like, ooh, ooh, I'm feeling just so strong. And then I go wake up Jamie and go, get that snake out of my house, okay? And so when I'm thinking about that, I'm looking at that story. What you would never do is to see that snake in your kitchen and just be like, night snake, hit the lights and go to bed. You wouldn't ignore it. There is a threat, there is a danger that can harm you and your family and poison it and it has to be addressed. It has to be removed. And the same is true with our spiritual life. But I think so often, so many of us, we see things that are a threat, are a danger to our walk with the Lord, our spiritual vitality, and we don't remove it. We just ignore it. We turn a blind eye to it. Oh, it's okay, I think we can handle it. And I think the text, what Josiah is doing is showing here, like, no, we have to rip this stuff out. We gotta get the stake, the things that would lead us away from the presence of the Lord. We have to get out of our house. So maybe a question for you today. As you're considering experiencing revival, what in your life needs to be removed because it leads you away from the worship of God. Now we all know, probably could identify some of the evil, sinful things we take out. And I just wanna, I wanna explore a concept with you. Now just to be honest, I don't see this in the text. This is kind of destined going off and just kind of having some thoughts and I, I wonder about, so just go with me to understand, I don't see this in the text. Yes, we need to remove the, those things that are a threat, that are dangerous, that are sinful, that take us away from the Lord. But is there anything else we could remove? Are there things that are actually good that are preventing us from experiencing spiritual revival? What got me thinking about this was a, a book I was reading, Think Again, by Adam Grant. He's a kind of work clinical psychologist, and uh, he tells a story about smoke jumpers. Smoke jumpers are people, brave men and women, who went and there's a huge wilderness fire. They parachute in behind the fire, and they fight the fire down there on the ground. So it's Storm King Mountain. In Colorado, 1994, lightning strikes in the wilderness, sets the forest ablaze. Smoke jumpers are deployed. They go in, they parachute in, they're, they're fighting the fire, doing the best they can, but the wind changes, it swirls up. There's, there's 30 foot walls of fire. And now they're not trying to fight the fire anymore. Now they're trying to survive the fire. They've got to turn, they've got to run, they've got to get out of there. Unfortunately, that night, we lost 14 smoke jumpers, 10 men and four women, never returned home to their families. So some scientists were studying this. And they go, is there, is there anything we can do that would have changed that outcome? As we train up new smoke jumpers, can we learn from this tragic, horrible accident and help smoke jumpers of the future be able to return home from their families and not suffer the same fate. So they did this really in-depth study of the smoke jumpers and all that happened, where are the winds and stuff like that, and here's what they found out. Had those smoke jumpers dropped their tools, think about it, they're, they're carrying probably a 50-pound backpack. They've probably got about a 25-pound chainsaw, and every single one of them had them and just kept it, tried to run. Had they dropped the chainsaw, had they let go of the backpack, let go of their ax, the scientists said each of them would have been able to move 20 to 25% faster and every single one of them would have made it out alive. Now the tools that they're holding are good things. That's why they're deployed and these things would help them. But they needed to lay down some good things so they could move faster and have life. 
I think there could be a spiritual application of that. Are there any good things, good tools that we hold on to, but yet may be holding us down and we need to remove, we need to let go of in order to experience revival? I think about perfectionism. Is perfectionism not a good thing? To want to do things with quality and with excellence as best as you can. Yes, but maybe that's a tool that's a little too heavy to carry. And it's holding us back from experiencing all that God would have. I'm not saying be, be lazy and do things you know, without excellence, but you have to process that. Maybe for you, it, it's your job, it's your career. It's a good thing. It, you have been given gifts and opportunities and you're studying well and providing for your family. But maybe there's something about it that's holding you back from experiencing vitality in Christ. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's a social media. I don't know what it is that you could be holding on to that may even be a good thing, but could it be weighing us down? That's for you to think through, to pray about, to talk to your community about. The question is, is there something you need to remove, to set down, to let go of, that may actually be a good thing, but may be holding you back from experiencing revival? Because good is the enemy of great. A couple more. Second Chronicles 35. Now I'm jumping to Second Chronicles because this story is uh, recorded in two separate places and there's different details in each so we get a more full, robust, big picture of what's happening. So here's Second Chronicles. He, Josiah, appointed the priest to their offices and encouraged him in the service of the house of the Lord. And he said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord to put the holy ark Back in the house that Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, built. You need not carry it on your soldiers. Now, sold, soldiers, uh, that, that word right here, this thing I can't say. Now serve the Lord your God and his people of Israel. The fifth step to experiencing revival is to replace back tangible items for worship that were removed. My question to you would be, is there anything you need to put back in your life? that would lead you, something physical, that would lead you into spiritual vitality to worship the Lord. It's so interesting. Andy Wise, who, who writes uh, Tech Wise Family, he makes this really good case about technology. I think there's a great spiritual application. He says, what's, what's put out, what's put in prominence takes precedent. What, what is seen is, is used, right? What is visible is what is consumed. And so he kind of pushes to go like, hey, like in your house, what is it? Is there a big honking giant TV screen in the middle of your living room? Is there a tablet or a screen in every, is there a phone like always within arm reach? What's out, what's available is used. What takes prominence takes precedence, right? And so for him and his family, what he's just saying, hey, there's, there's the thought is to take some of these tech things and like for him, he, what he says is we got one TV and it's in the basement. Like it's in the movie room. Like we go down there just, just, to, just to watch TV. But what's in the living room is a piano, our art supplies, our games to play, you know, books to read. And so we know this to be true. Like if you did this experiment at your house, let's say you go to the store and buy a bag of candy and a bag of grapes. And so you get home and you take the candy and you stuff it way back in the pantry. But you take the grapes and you pluck every one and you wash it in the water and you put it in some beautiful bowl right there on the table out in the middle of everything. You know what's gonna happen? Those grapes are going to be gone. People are going to have them. They're going to come by. They're going to pick them because they're out. They're viewed. They're available, and they will be used to consume. And someone might find the candy. Now, just swap them. Stuff the grapes back in the fridge or something like that. Don't tell anyone about them. Take the candy. Set it out. Beautiful bowl. Unwrap it all. And it's going to get used. So what we see, what is visible, what is tangible, what is out, what is prominence, will take precedence, will be used and consumed. I think this is why Josiah takes the Ark of the Covenant and puts it back into the house of the Lord. He goes, man, there's something, a physical, tangible presence we need to put back to lead us to worship to God. So the question for you, to experience personal revival, is there any physical, tangible item you need to reintroduce back into your life? I mean, like, what's by your bedside table? Is it your phone? or your Bible. I mean, what if that was the first thing we saw when we woke up? The last thing we saw when we went to bed? 
When we want to sit, you know, like what, what is it? What, what, what could, you, could you write a Bible verse on your mirror? Is there something you could do? Is there a devotion you could sit at the kitchen table that the family, hey, we pick this up and we, we, we look at it, we touch it, and it leads us to worship. Feel free to introduce some physical, tangible items that will lead you to worship. In, in his book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, he talks about this, how to create a habit. There's a cue, boom, there's a response, boom, and then there's a reward. So Q is, hey, I, I see my Bible. The response is I, I pick it up and read it. And then what's the reward? So he says to like, train your body to do this. You have to go through that process. So for you, I mean, like, have fun with this, right? Have fun with the reward. Put your Bible on your bedside table. Buy a big box of chocolates to go beside it. And every time you read your Bible, you see it, cue, response, read it. Then have some chocolate. Like, treat yourself, okay? And just get into this habit, into this rhythm. You can do this with many other things. But I think there's power experiencing leading us to revival. We have these tangible, physical items that would lead us into worship to God. Last one is this, 2 Kings 23, 21. And the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord, your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. For no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel during all the days of the king of Israel, the kings of Judah. The sixth step and final step, I believe, from this text, from this passage, to experiencing revival is to restore spiritual practices that remind you of your need and rekindle your affection for Jesus. A question to contemplate. Is there any spiritual practice or habit or rhythm that needs to be restored? Family dinner, date night with your spouse, Sabbath. Do you ever literally stop for 24 hours? What about your quiet time? What about fasting? What about tithing? What about serving in your local church? What about evangelism? What are these spiritual disciplines, spiritual practices, spiritual rhythms, just like they had Passover? They did this every year to remind them of what God had done. It would lead them to worship, it would lead them to spiritual vitality, but they hadn't done it for 70 years because it was written in the book of the law that was lost in the temple. But now it's been brought back and he goes, hey, we got to rekindle our affection for Jesus. Well, not Jesus for them, but for God, for Yahweh, who delivered them, who the angel of death passed over the house and they brought them out of Egyptian slavery. And so you and I, the same thing, what spiritual practices have we neglected? Have we forgot about? Have we lost along the way? And then if we brought them back, might see our souls vibrant again, walking, abiding in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's someone listening to this and you see all these other people with this relationships with God and you're like, what do I gotta do? What do I gotta have? And, and Maybe for you, you're like, man, I, I wanna experience revival, but for some of you, there's a possibility you can't experience life again because you've never experienced life to begin. You see, all of us are born into the world what the Bible says, we are dead in our sins, dead in our trans, spiritually, no life. And so we can't be revived and have spiritual vitality again unless we have it for the first time. Here's what Ephesians says. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love by which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive with Christ Jesus, by grace you have been saved. For some of you, it's not finding life again, it's finding life to begin, and God will meet you. Not of your own effort, nothing you did, whatever's landed on your lap, right? He says it's by his grace, his love, he will make you alive with Christ if you put your faith and trust in Jesus as your savior. Have you done that? Have you experienced life to be given, be made alive in Christ? And if you haven't, could today be the day? Would you let someone know? Would you connect with us, connect with this church so we can help you 
in that life you have in Christ, and then walk with you all along the way, especially when it, you know, it, it atrophies and it gets weak and something gets off, and we can help bring revival back and spiritual vitality again. I kind of want to close with this. is The goal of experiencing life in Christ, revival life again, spiritual vitality again, isn't solely for your sake. Like, it's not just like, oh yeah, good, me and God, we're great, and I'm just so vibrant and have full of life with Jesus, and that's where it ends. Like, that's where it begins. That's a great place to start. But your relationship and your, your abundance and walk with Jesus Christ isn't just for you. We want you to experience life in Christ so you can help others experience life in Christ. You to be revived in a deep spiritual vitality. You can help others experience that spiritual vitality. So that's why it's so important. Yes, it starts with you and you in this incredible relationship, vibrant with God, experiencing that spiritual life that maybe you once had or maybe you've never had you have that. But then to take that and to bring it to others, to show them that there is life in Christ. I'll close with this. Beautiful verse in 2 Kings 23. Speaking of Josiah, it says before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all of his heart and his soul and his might, according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Josiah could have been just another king. He could have just followed in the footsteps of his father, of his grandfather. He could have ignored, he could have excused some things. But he didn't. He refreshed his perspective. Josiah was remorseful and repentant of sin. He recommitted within the context of community. He removed everything that led him astray from the worship of the Lord. He replaced back tangible items for worship and he restored spiritual practices. And you know the result? He experienced personal revival. Not just that, his nation, his people experienced revival. Oh, my friend, I hope and pray for you today that you would not just be another person, another spouse, another parent, another employee. I pray that you would live in such a way that what would be said of you would be that there was none like you, that turn with all your might and all your heart and all your soul to the Lord, and that you would experience revival, not just for yourself, but that would spill over into your families, into your neighbors, to your coworkers, our community, and our nation. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for this eight-year-old boy King Josiah who does what is right in the eyes of the Lord. I can't imagine how hard and how difficult that would be, Jesus. But thank you. And how we can even glean some of the practices and principles and things that he did and apply them to our own life today. God, if any of us who are listening have experienced some spiritual atrophy, we've, we're spiritually sick or dry or unhealthy, that's been revealed to us, God. We may put these practices into place to experience revival, spiritual vitality once again. God, if there are any who've never experienced that life, would they know it is a free gift? You paid the price. You offer it freely. If they would put their faith and trust in you as Savior, they could experience life in Christ for the very first time and live in that abundance and goodness of you. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. Help us to have the spiritual vitality, but to look outside of ourselves of who we can share this life in Christ with. You are good, God, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today, for watching this. I'm praying that you would experience revival. If there's any way that our church can come alongside and connect with you, we would love to know. We would love to be able to partner with you in experiencing this walk with the Lord. So the best way you can let us know is to go online to rpc.fm connect. 
there. You can just let us know what's going on, what God is doing in your life. It could be a, kind of this first act of obedience, of maybe repentance, of coming back. Whatever's happening, would you use that URL address, rpc.fm slash connect, to let us know so we can follow up with you, walk alongside you in your journey with Jesus. Again, thank you so much. Let me give you a blessing, and then we'll be done for the day. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the countenance of the Lord fall upon you, and may he grant you peace. God bless, and have a great day.